this PC tape. Glory to Jesus. After going through the the readings of today, and of course the readings in this period of Advent, I entitled today's homily A Covenant Keeping God. But before then, I want to mention briefly three spiritual advice or advices to us, especially in regards to the season in which we are now. The season of Advent. Is a fraternal advice. My dear brothers and sisters, I encourage you to take advantage of this season to take stock of your life. Take advantage of this season to take stock of your life. The liturgy of the church is very beautiful. So in this period of Advent, which is nearer to the end of the year, it is expedient and necessary that as a child of God and as a Christian, that you retreat for the best of you. You retreat for the best of you. You have a lot of potentials, a lot of qualities, gifts, blessings in you. And this is a time to retreat and to allow the best to come out in you. Of course, tomorrow as a parish, we shall begin our three days Advent retreat. I just finished mine. You know, the priest in this of in the Lagos Archdiocese, um, in the first two weeks of Advent, would normally begin retreat. So I joined the first batch, and we just finished on Friday. We are we to discover that we need to make amendment and to make the way of the Lord straight in our own lives. So as we begin on Monday tomorrow, I want you to see it as a spiritual journey for you. Of course, I expected that to begin from the first week or first Sunday of Advent, thinking about your life. You will not be coming to meet Father Ozele. You will be coming to meet Jesus. Let it be your point of departure. I want to see Jesus. The second advice, my dear friends, is I encourage you to take advantage of the season to draw closer to God. Let Jesus increase in your life and let I or my ego decrease. One of the persons or personalities who shall be hearing often in this season of Advent is John. Excuse me, it's John the Baptist. And he said, he must increase and I must decrease. So let Jesus increase. Let your shadow decrease. 
Shadows are the weak points, the weaknesses of our lives. Let them decrease and let Christ, the light, shine more. Take these candles as your life. Five of them, of course, the last one will be coming as we enter the vigil of Christmas. But each of these candles should speak to your life, to my life. There are four of them now, or five later. And each of them, the first Sunday talks about hope. The today talks about peace. And the third, the next Sunday will be about joy. And the last will represent love. And then the white candle is represent Christ. So we use this period to allow the fires of hope. We are living in a period that people have lost hope. And Jesus is reviving us again and bringing hope to our lives. A period that people in their personal life, marriages, communities are not experiencing peace. Jesus is the peace we are seeking. In a time of sadness that many people have lost their joy, there was a time that there was a study that came out that Nigerians are the most happiest people. I don't know if you heard that in the world. Do you agree? Eh? Do you also agree that we are the headquarters of poverty? Do you agree? So how do you reconcile the two? People lost joy because of so many things. And then love. And then Christ. So these are just an addendum to my reflection this morning. So we are talking about a covenant-keeping God. It is only a God that is faithful to his covenant that can do what he is doing or he has done in this period. What we are celebrating in this period is the faithfulness of God to this covenant. Covenant is usually entered between two people. So, the covenant that God entered between Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God has kept it. But on our own part, we are the weakest part in this covenant. We human beings. We are sinners, and we have not kept our own promises and vows. We have failed in this covenant. But God always understands. God always understands that we are the weaker parts in this covenant. Psalm 103 verse 14 says, For he knows how we were made. God knows how we are made. And he goes further to say, He knows that we are made of dust. And this is what the church reminds us on Ash Wednesday. You are dust, and upon dust you shall return. But how many of us understand this? How many of us live in understanding that we are dust. That should bring a humility to our lives. A simplicity. Christmas is 
coming soon. Many of you have gone for shopping for your children. Some of you have gone shopped in Dubai, in Canada, in the US. So beautiful. But what about the maid in your home, in your house? Where did you go for her or his own shopping? Why I'm saying this is that you have to realize that even your own children and that your maid, all of us are dust. All of us. It doesn't matter how much you have or the position you have reached. God is saying, I understand that you are dust. And you know what happens to dust when you blow? It's gone. So when God blows, you will be lifeless. So let us have this in mind, because Advent is also a period of sober reflection, a period we think about our lives and our actions. As a consequence of not keeping the covenant, because of people's disobedience, they found themselves in the hands of their enemies, as the first reading tells us today. That the people of Israel were in the hands of their enemies, the Babylonians. And the situation was very bad. Very sad situation they found themselves, as a result of their own disobedience. They became slaves. They encountered pains, there was hunger, intimidation, and insecurity. Just like what we experience in Nigeria these days. If you are conversant with the news, you will know that insecurity is hiking in our nation. And the problem is that we play the game of numbers. When a human life is lost, we no longer have regard for human life in this nation. Look at the farmers, innocent farmers, rice farmers, who were killed in Borono, I think, either 28 of um, November, towards the end of the month, or is it early beginning of this month? And you could read the defense of the government that's supposed to protect her citizens. People are playing the game of number. It's not 104. It's not 110. It's not 76. It is 40. 40 are not human beings. It's only 40. And worse of it is blaming them for not obtaining the permission to go and farm from the military when a human life is lost. The game of number is the same situation of Israel that the people of Israel found themselves in our first reading today is similar to what we are experiencing in our country, Nigeria, and in our lives. We have found ourselves in the hand of Babylonians. We find ourselves in the hand of Babylonians. The politicians have turned to Babylonians, to the citizens. Our leaders that are supposed to be caring for us, providing for this nation with the blessings that God has blessed us with, are intimidating us. And as a consequence, many people are dying of hunger and dying of insecurity. So we find ourselves in the Babylonians of bad governance. 
But then, my dear friends, it's not just only the politicians. Some of our husbands are Babylonians to their wives. Some husbands are Babylonians. Threats intimidate their wives that the wives have become slaves to the man they married to. Many women are suffering. Some women cannot even take decision in their homes because their husbands have turned to Babylonians. Many wives are also Babylonians too. I have seen men who cry bitterly for what their wives are doing to them. You need to ask yourself, are you a Babylonian to people around you? Sometimes we pastors and priests and bishops and men of God have become Babylonians to the people that we are supposed to protect and to speak the words of comfort. The word of God said to prophet Isaiah, speak to them, say comfort, comfort my people. So we have become manipulators and extort money as men of God from the people and threaten the life of people. Parents, are you a Babylonian? Are you Babylonians to your children? When you no longer show care, concern, and love to them. Or children also can be Babylonians to their parents. When you choose to disobey your parents and do things in your own way, When you call your mother a witch, you are a Babylonian. There are many men here who no longer call their mothers, who no longer visit their parents because of their wives. These are what we face when we sit in the office sometimes. That your mother-in-law has become a witch and Christmas is coming, you have bought clothes for your wives and your children, but your aging parents at home, you no longer care about them. They are witch. They are the problem of your, of your family. You are a Babylonian if you act in this way. Our security agencies in this country have become Babylonians as well. when they have sought to torture the lives of the citizens that they are supposed to protect, killing them recklessly. Are you a Babylonian as a neighbor, as a colleague? How do you live with your neighbors in the same compound? Are you intimidating them? Are you fighting them? Are you subjecting them to slavery? Your tenant, you the landlord. Or you also a tenant or a servant? Are you a Babylonian too? In the way you treat your master and take your job. My dear friends, the people of Israel endured humiliation that many of us are going through. For several years, they were in the hand of the Babylonians as slaves. But today, the, Lord, the word of the Lord echoed, Comfort, comfort my people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. In the midst of this suffering, God still calls them my people. Even when they have gone astray, even when they have not kept their own part of the covenant, God calls them my people. And that is how God looks at each one of us. 
you are my son, you are my daughter. It doesn't matter how far you have gone away from him. You still belong to him. The life you are living is of the Lord. The breath you have is of the Lord. So even in the land of Babylonian, God says, you are my people. Comfort them. Speak tenderly to them. And I'm speaking the same to people who are here that are going through humiliation of any kind. Even from people you think they should protect you, they should love you, they should care for you. But they are not doing it. God is speaking to you this morning. He says, take heart. Take comfort. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. We are the Jerusalem today. And cry to her that her warfare has ended. And we are prophesying on this altar that the warfare of this nation has come to an end. That the advent of Jesus will bring about a change, a good governance, a good leadership in this country in the name of Jesus. Even in your own family, whatever war you are going through, the word of God is for you this morning. He says, talk to him. Tell her her warfare has come to an end. Your iniquity is pardoned. It doesn't matter your past. It doesn't matter your iniquities. God is a God of mercy and compassion. And he's saying, tell her, you have suffered because of your iniquities. You have gone into the hand of the Babylonians because of your sins. But your time of iniquity has come to an end. The people cried for so long. They cried to the Lord. And it is time to comfort the people. Your prayers are not in vain. The prayers we are making for this country. The prayers you are praying for a change of heart of your husband. A change of heart of your wife. A change of heart of your enemies are not in vain. They should prepare. That is what prophet Isaiah was telling the people. Prepare. Because the Lord is coming to save you. The Lord is coming. The Advent is a period we are saying, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. What is he coming to do? He's coming for you in order to bring about joy, hope, peace, love, and the light in your life. This is a message of joy. We shouldn't go home sad. We shouldn't go home perturbed. Let Christ be our hope. Paul says, Christ is our hope. The hope of our, joy, of our salvation. This is a message of liberation. A message of comfort. The second reading today tells us that God is never slow. Many of us are thinking that God is slow. Why is God not punishing and killing all the wicked leaders? Why the innocents are dying? Many of us have prayed for our enemies to die, and they are not dying. Amen? Even people might have prayed for you to die, and you have not died. So don't think that you are the only one people are offended, you know. You know, sometimes we have that mentality. Everybody is against me. You are also against people. There are people that hate you as well. Don't think it's Father Peter alone that people hate. There are people who don't love you. There are people who wish you death and evil as well. And you also wish people... This is human wickedness. This is human evil. And we find ourselves in this game. We find ourselves in this game. 
everyone, even the clergy. So let us not take God's patience as weakness. This is what second reading is reminding us. The book of Second Peter. Don't take it as a weakness. God is never slow. He works according to his plan. He is also patient with us so that we may repent and avoid punishment. And that was the preaching of John the Baptist in the gospel today. Repent. 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 Both the first reading and the second reading echo the same word. The Lord is not slow about his promise as some of us count slowness. God is not Baba, go slow. This is how we tagged our president, Baba, go slow. And people are looking at God in that way. God is not Baba, go slow. He knows what he's doing, you know. It's not our leaders who don't know what they are doing. God knows what he's doing. And he says, but take his slowness with you and patient with you or his forbearance with you as an opportunity for you to repent. But his forbearance towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. This is the will of God, that all of us should go to heaven. God doesn't want any of us to get missing on the last day. He wants us to be saved, and that is why he sent his only son into the world. My dear friends, Advent is a period to pause and reflect about the things we do. What are the areas that we need to repent from? John the Baptist said, prepare the way of the Lord. Which way will you prepare? Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. This is what God is expecting from our lives. All the rugged places in my life, in your life, we should make them plain and make them straight. This is the cry of John as well in the gospel. But John the Baptist, through his life and his words today, speak to us how to prepare for this coming feast of Advent or the celebration of Christmas. He demonstrated this with his great poverty. The poverty he lived in was a lesson for us in this world of deep-rooted materialism. Even as we are preparing for Christmas, many of us are busy buying cars, buying clothes, buying shoes, finishing their houses in the village, repenting them. All these are good, but they are not the essentials. As you get older, you begin to understand what I'm speaking now, that they are not the essentials of your life. The essentials of our lives is our relationship with God in this period. Our, the essentials of our lives is if God comes now, where shall I be? It's not about the clothes. It's not about the new shoes. They are for this material world. When we die, what goes up is not your shoes. It's not this body. I listened to a man who was a motivational speaker of America, and he was talking about his grandmother, when his grandmother died, and they were at the hospital. And the grandmother was weighing before her death. When she came to the hospital, she weighed 138 pounds. And they saw her dying. And when she died, 
I think it is a custom, maybe in the U.S., that they need also to reweigh her weight again. Before she died, she was 138 pounds. And when she died, they weighed her again. And her weight was 138. The question is, what left? She's lifeless, getting stiffed, and still weighing 138 that she was weighing while alive. What made up the 138 of her life and 60 of your life or 70 pounds or whatever you weigh are not the essentials of your life. They are the things that will remain and go to dust. All this we eat and drink and wear are, are the things that make up, I don't know whatever you weigh, but they are the things that will not leave us. They will go to dust. God is not interested in them. Whether you have 10 cars, whether you have 40 shoes, is not his business. His business is the salvation of your soul. And John is teaching us this. In this period of Advent, that we are so much engrossed in material things. In a world that is so fashioned. Do you know, in this period of Christmas, you will see new designs. So. You know, they say the beautiful ones are not yet born. The beautiful clothes are not yet made. Oh. The beautiful hairstyles are not yet made. Even when you think you have seen it, it is ephemeral. It disappears. Another one will come because they are not the substance of our lives. But unfortunately, this is what you and I are running after every day. This is what we are pursuing in our lives. Even in this period that we are waiting for Jesus, it is a period to showcase how many cars, how many shoes, how many clothes, new designs that I can afford. Don't forget, I am not excluded though. I said all of us, the clergy, we are fashion crazy, greed for food. This period, people will eat and eat and eat and eat on the 25th and eat and eat as if to say they will die the following day. And people will drink and drink and drink. Why are there so much accident, death in this period? Because of gluttony and drunkenness. People lose their senses. So watch it. People are busy unjustly storing up treasures for themselves here. A world where people do damages to their souls because they struggle for material things. People sell their bodies in order to gain positions or gain material things. People belong to occult. People do rituals. Every Christmas you will hear the announcement, take care of yourself so there will be kidnappers so you will hear they will cut people's private parts, they will cut people's head, they will cut people's different parts for sacrifice and rituals to make money. We hear this in this period. People sell their souls to the devil in order to drive new cars, to wear new clothes, to build new houses. John is telling us, do you know how John appeared today in the gospel? The one who prepared the way for the Lord. How did he appear? We are told that he appeared in a wilderness. What is a wilderness? A place of lack. A place of dryness. There is no superfluous life. In a wilderness. That is where he was, he was announcing in the wilderness the coming of the Messiah. And he was clothed with camel's hair. 
You may wear the best clothes, but you are empty. You may wear the best clothes of your life, but you are empty. One old priest looked at me one day, not now, no, when I was very young. He said, you, ah, you look very handsome. And I was very happy, like many of you now. If they say you are beautiful, wow, your head is blowing. As I was rejoicing, he said, he didn't end there. I was a seminarian. He said, I hope your soul is handsome. All the joy vanished because I knew myself that my soul was not handsome. The body was. John came. It's not about what he was wearing, but the message that was coming out of his mouth. You may be rich, you may be intelligent, but what comes of, out of your mouth makes you the man or the woman you are. He ate locust and wild honey. Locust and wild honey. So it's not about the food. It's not about the drink. And I think we need, we, we should begin to check what we eat and what we drink. His message was for repentance, for us to prepare the way for the Lord. What are you going to prepare for? What are you going to repent from in this period of Advent? You know, when we talk about sin, and you hear people say, I don't think I have any sin. Because they limit sin to fornication, adultery, and sexual immorality. This is how many of us consider sin. Oh. As long as you are not falling in any of this, you have not committed any sin. But I want to tell you this morning that you need to repent from things more than these sexual immoralities. In this period of Advent, there are things you need to watch for in your life. Number one is indifferent attitude towards people. Indifferent attitude. It's not my business. It doesn't concern me. Somebody is suffering. And I'm taking this message to make an appeal that we should become our brother's keeper. Whatsoever you do to the least of this, my brothers and sisters, you do that unto me. When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. It's a period of charity. Advent is a period to do more, to go out of your family and help people who are suffering. Many Nigerians are suffering of hunger, of food. I am always happy when I see people in this period re-roofing the, ro the roof of their neighbor's houses in the village. There are people who do that. They know that during rainy season, these people suffered and they don't have money to roof their house. This is the best place you can even surrender your tithes. For me, I'm not speaking for every other priest. This is the best place that you can even surrender your tithe in the poor who is dying. You cannot carry 100,000 and you are coming to give me in the church. And somebody is in the hospital dying of cancer and they say 100,000 will save that person's life. And you say, no, I'm going to, the, to give my tithe. I don't know if God will accept that tithe. I say I don't know because I'm not God. This is a time to look out for someone in your village. Many of you will travel. Look out for somebody. Help that person. Don't be indifferent to people suffering and plight. There are people who need that cup of rice. It may be very small. Give it out. There is blessing and joy in giving than in receiving. 
The more you receive, the more empty you become. But the more you give, the more joyful and happier you become. Ask yourself this question. Look at the rich people in the world, Bill Gates. Ask why is he spending his money for the poor? He divided his will already. And don't think he has packed everything to his children like many of us do. Many of us are busy storing up for our children that may not even remember us at the, on the old, old age. It has happened. I've seen people who spend a lot of money for their children and build houses. And the children tell you, I'm not ready to come back to Nigeria. Are you not the one sending them to abroad? They go there, the security is good, the lifestyle is beautiful, and you are here building. You have this one here in uh, Omole. You have in Omole phase two. You have in, um, uh, 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 I don't know, many of the places in Lagos. And you are busy at Ebe, at Leki, at Aja. You are busy building and building and building. And then you finish. You are in your 80s or 90s. You think they will come back to live there. They will say, I don't want to come back to this. I don't know how to speak it to because... But I don't want to come back to this shit nation or country. Then you begin to look for buyers at your 80 years of age. You are looking for buyers. Why can't you give them little? Let them fetch for themselves. I don't say you shouldn't give them anything, but spend it on charity. And I tell you, you will never regret it in your life. Help the poor. Don't be indifferent in this period. What about gossip? Two of you are gathered together. Who do you talk about? You discuss, talk about your choir master. You discuss about your CWO chair lady. You discuss about the CMO chairperson. You discuss about Father Peter. You talk about Father Augustine. You talk. <laughs> One husband beat his wife to hell. And I said, what happened? He said, the wife is gossiping about him with the neighbors. Even people gossip about their husband. When you sit with your fellow lady, it's your husband you are discussing. You know? Gossip. Can't you work on it in this period? Too much talking. Some people have diarrhea of the mouth. Ha. You can't tell them secret. Oh. Please. Don't tell anybody. She just told me. But don't tell anybody. It's only you. Diarrhea of the mouth. Talking, 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 talking. Advent is a period you ask yourself, is this my weakness? Over-possessive and obsessed of what you have. Some of us are over-possessive of what we have. That we cannot leave it. Even as we are preaching, some people's hands are on their phone now. Because they cannot leave their phone. Oh. And if your phone gets missing, that day they will burn the whole house. Oh. Everywhere will be helter skelter. Helter skelter. It's not about the, 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 this alone, oh. even cars as well. Every one of us, every one of us, when I preach, I preach to myself. There are things I'm obsessed with as well. That are things I have. And I find it difficult to leave them. And sometimes I ask why. When I die now, everything will, will, will go. Why am I so much obsessed with these things? These cars. These material things. It can be gluten, the food or drink that you need to work on. It can be the way you talk down on people under you. Somebody said... You can tell me how great a man is or a woman by the way he or she talks to people under him or her. I'm telling you the truth. You know how great a man is the way you talk to your driver, the way you talk to your cook, the way you talk to your gate man. That shows how great you are. Those people on, in your office, how you down you talk to them shows how great you are. Or how little you are. Are you not also thinking about whether you are perpetual latecomers to programs, to activities, to church? 
going to your office. They say going to office is eight, and you will go nine, and you will write eight on the register still. Check it. What about school? Going to church. What about the laziness? Some of us are lazy. Some of us spend a lot of time on social media. Can you work on it too? Every time your hand is on the phone, you're on Facebook, you're on Instagram, you're on, on uh, 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 WhatsApp. Every time, every time, some of us are addicted. Before we sleep, we spend one hour or two hours on social media. Are you spending too much time on yourself too? Some of us have become idols and we worship ourselves in front of mirror. Many men are angry with their wives. Let's go for a meeting. 30 minutes, the woman was, is still in front of Miro, making up and idolizing himself, herself. And the men, too, we have joined the, the game. How many minutes do you spend in front of Miro, adoring yourself? How many minutes do you spend here adoring Jesus? You can spend one hour. Use all the levels of makeup. All the levels to cover your old age or your wrinkles. Nobody is smiling. No? <laughs> I thought they say Nigerians are the happiest people in the world. Amen. So, what am I saying? You spend more time idolizing yourself more than you do for God. 30 minutes, you are making up. It's good to make up, but make up also your soul. What about reckless driving? Many of us who drive. Can't you check that in this period? So it's not about fornication, adultery, but look at all this. Reckless driving. What about wastage of energy, water, food? Can't you take what you will finish? Do you know how many people are dying of hunger every day? Every day. Every day. If you take time in this period to visit less privileged ones people may be in prison there are people in prison i am not exaggerating if i blow them with my mouth they will fall i worked in the prison for two years in sierra leone and one of the salation brother got a project to feed them in prison and the first day we came to feed the prisoners if you look at them, you will share tears. But before then, we started chorus because every Friday I go there. And see the way that we are praising God. Oh. Praising God. Even in prison. In that situation. Then we brought food, chicken and rice and drinks. Not exaggerating. Many of them were not able to hold the lap of chicken and bite it. They were so weak and fragile. And this is how they were dying, you know. They told us they, they, they died. They just died, they, they moved them. A prison that's supposed to take 200 people is taking 2,000 people. Congestion. You don't know what God is doing for you. And you are complaining, you know. You are complaining that you are not able to buy the car you're supposed to buy in 2020. Your COVID has cost you the money you're supposed to use to finish your house. There are people who can't even see life to finish that house. So you have a lot to thank God for. Updating yourself. Some of us are not updating ourselves in our profession. It is also something you question yourself about. What about the environment? Littering everywhere. You eat biscuit, you throw it. You eat banana, you throw it. This 
things are not good. And last time we talked about taking care of the nature that Pope is, was telling us. So, my dear friends, prepare the way for the Lord by checking on the above things that I have mentioned. The Lord is coming in this period of Advent. And how is the Lord coming? The Lord is coming in the people you meet every day. Don't wait that the Lord is coming when I am 80, when I am 90. The second reading says, A day is like a thousand years in the eyes of the Lord. And a thousand years is like a day. It's not about the day, it's about now. In the people you meet, in the people you work with in the office, in the people you worship together with in the same church, the Lord is meeting you in them. In the poor, the Lord is meeting you. In the sacraments, in the sacraments. Some of us here, it has taken 10 years. Some 15. Some men, especially men. If they, they, are, if they are celebrating 25th year wedding anniversary, know that the last time they went for confession, Meno was 25 years ago. Men. They are afraid of the mercy of God, of approaching God. Advent is a period to reconcile with God again. You meet Jesus in the sacrament of the reconciliation. Remember what he says in the first reading. Your years of iniquities are over. Your sins are pardoned. There is no sin that God cannot forgive. There is no sin that is bigger than the mercy of God. And there is no sin you think you are committing that people have not committed in the past. And they are living in the present in a saintly way. This period of three days of Advent retreat for our parish is a period to approach Jesus in the sacrament of reconciliation. We are very lucky in this parish. I just finished the retreat of the priest and we had a meeting with the archbishop and people were lamenting how other parishioners in other parishes we are complaining and lamenting how they are being deprived of the sacrament of reconciliation that you have here every day, three times. We give you three times every day, after morning mass, after afternoon mass, after evening mass. And on Saturday, after morning mass, and by 5.30 p.m. Which reason are you going to give God now? That you cannot approach the sacrament of reconciliation. Why are you not going for confession? And people say, no, I can confess direct. God has given the apostles the authority and the church. The Catholic Church is a church of sacraments. You may not see these four candles in other churches because they don't believe in the sacrament. Whatever we do here is a sacrament and a sacrament is an outward sign of an inward grace. It's telling us something that we don't even see. Sacrament reveals God to us. Why are you not going for confession? Why 20 years? And the worst thing that you don't know is this. One, no priest whatsoever you have told him in the confession will say it out to your enemies, even your enemies. Once a priest does that, he incurs on himself latter, uh, latter sentencia. Automatically, he's no longer priest. Even if you kill the mother of a priest or the father, father of a priest, let me use the father because my father is dead already. So, <laughs> even if you kill the father of a priest, and we are looking for who killed my father, and you come to confession and say, Father, I am the one. Even if police, they are looking for who killed. I have no, no, but I am under a vow never to say it. I just want you to know the power of the secrecy of the sacrament of confession. 
I worked in prison in Sierra Leone two years. All what the prisoners told me, I will never tell the warders. Is it warders? Warden or warders? All those in charge. I will never. I look at them, I know what they told me, and I will never. And they trust us to say it. So, I don't know what is stopping you from going for confession. Oh. Tomorrow may be too late. Tomorrow may be too late. Reconcile with God now. God will meet you even at the point of death. People have slumped and died. Even young and old. Our brother who died two Fridays ago from this parish, they, it will be mentioned, it will be announced, died at the age of 34. 34. We are going to have the service of song coming soon, which will be announced. So don't think you are too young, bro, or don't think you can die. Don't say you have doctors. How many doctors do you think Michael Jackson had? How many doctors? Surround, even the time of death, how many doctors surrounded him? And in the midst of all these doctors, family doctors, uh, personal doctors, he has a doctor in charge of leg, doctor in charge of hand, doctor in charge of teeth, doctor in charge of ear, doctor in charge of heart, doctor in charge... All of them surrounded him at the time of his death. But... He died. So don't think uh, because you take vegetable and fruit, you will not die. <laughs> don't forget all those things, dust to dust. Don't forget it. They are the, if they are weighing 60, they will be weighing 60, but they will not go. What goes? Take care of the soul. Confession is a healing of the soul. Confession is a sacrament of healing. I don't know why I'm emphasizing on this today. Confession is a sacrament of healing. Heal your soul, heal your life. I see many men, they don't come for communion. Why? Even if, even if your wife doesn't know and you have a child somewhere, Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 says, Come, let us settle the matter. The Lord says, Come, let us settle the matter. The church will never push you away. You need reconciliation with your wife, with your family, and you go back to the sacraments. And you go back to the sacraments. Even if you get pregnant, we are not advocating for all this, but I'm saying even if the mercy of God is there for you, come and reconcile, come and settle the matter with Jesus. And begin to receive the body and blood of Christ. Advent is a period for all this. My dear friends, I conclude with the word of St. Peter. Therefore, beloved, since you wait for this, be zealous to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Since you wait for him. Since you wait for him. Can you sing this Yoruba song? Fall for me, oh, Baba. Fall for me.